YouTubers, what's up? It's Tyler here again, and we're back at Clinton Machine Shop. Dennis really wanted to uh, test the pressure, which I understand that, so we're gonna take him in there and show you guys the process what he does for that. And also, I do believe my cam is here, so y'all wanna stay tuned for that. Look at this, guys. There it is, already machined. The display caps. She might actually survive. I think it'll be all right. <laughs> all right, so here's the cam. Dennis pulled out the box. So this is the original cam from Comp. This is the new one from Urson. Uh, the cores, as far as I'm concerned, they're they're probably the identical core that's made by the same core company, and you just got two different companies grinding them. Everything looks the same. Uh, this one worked well, but one of the things that we noticed that is different is to keep the gear from turning on the comp one. Pretty much, they drilled a hole and they put a roll pin in there, and that appears to be the only thing that keeps it from rotating, from what we can tell. On the Urson one, they also drilled the same hole, put a roll pin in it, but it appears that in addition, they also cut a slot inside the core. So this one, I don't see any reason why this gear should ever rotate on the core. Not at all, not at all. That's good to know. So this is the first time I've ordered a three-piece core for a small block Chevy from Urson, and I didn't know that they even made them. I'm glad to know that they make them, and it looks like they uh, they actually do a pretty good job of making sure that that gear is not going to turn. We're about to get super obsessive compulsive. I'm not going to say that this is the correct way to do these, but this is the way that I've been doing them for a while. Um, <laughs> to start off with, one of the things that I always do when I set up these springs is I always make sure that the point at end of the spring is facing upward. Gotcha. Uh, not going to say that you're going to cause any problems doing it the other way, but you start reading about stuff and finding out that these things are actually supposed to be made a certain way. You look at like LT1, or not LT1s, LS1s. These are opposite. If you get like a pack aftermarket LS1 spring, mm -hmm. you know, obviously these have to go on yes. a directional way. But you look at them and every single one of them will own it. Like a pack spring, for example, you see how one end's pointed and the other end's sort of like blunt. Uh, for what it's worth, we don't use a whole lot of them, but every now and then we'll get like a set of pack springs from pack. Mm -hmm. And when you open the box, there are there's the same way where you can tell somebody actually like installed the inners inside the outers with the points facing the same direction on both springs. Like I said, we're getting super OCD here. I'm not going to pretend like not doing this is going to cause some catastrophic failure because quite frankly it won't. But it's just before I start doing springs, I always go through on duels and triples for that matter and just make sure that all my all my points are facing in the same direction between inner and outer okay well i never knew that so that's that's a good tip i probably put heads together for three or four years before i ever knew about it so don't feel bad and this is the machine that's going to yeah, test that's, the pressure right that's a tester so because we have a dual spring naturally we have a retainer with a step on it Mm -hmm. So these have to get used in order to check our bind and to also check our actual heights because that step's going to play a role in our pressure and our bind because it's going to compress that inner spring. This is a pretty high quality retainer so I don't feel the need to go through all 16 of them but what I'll do for starters is I'll spot check the overall thickness because this measurement's going to come into play when we set up our spring tester. Oh yeah, yeah. See I just use calipers. That's probably way more accurate. Yeah because especially on these guys some of them you'll have to wear like a stock uh some of the ls1 retainers that little itty bitty step will be mm -hmm. the highest point so it becomes real difficult to get a caliper on it yep 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 so that one's 80. i'll pick that one up i off. got it to the rescue 80. Yeah, and I'm just going to check four of these. I've even cheap no, retainers. Yeah, yeah. Even cheap <clears throat> retainers, I've never seen thickness vary by more than five or six thousandths. So we're going to write that number down so we don't forget about it. And prop all our retainers on our springs. 
And it looks like you've done this before. Yeah, I do it, do it a lot. <laughs> and I believe, according to the box, Comp said that these things are supposed to bind at one one. One one, yeah, okay. yeah, one one. So we're gonna go ahead and check that. Um, I'd be willing to bet they probably bind at a lower height than that. I think everybody rates their stuff to be safe. Give us some wiggle room. Because you never know yeah. who's going to install it. That's and right. That's right. That's right. It. So we said we were at uh, 80, correct? 80, yeah. 80 on the retainer thickness. So this guy's zeroed out right now. But since we're checking these with the retainer installed, we need to add 80,000 sort of Oh, okay. Offset. So that's what that is. Then. Yep. So we're going to use some valve spring shims. We're going to go down. And that guy's the, just. Oh, I got you. Right there. Yep, yeah, we're gonna get it down to 80, as close as we can reasonably get, and then zero it. Gotcha. Okay, yep. so then we come off, go back down, and we're right 79 at 7980. Yep, okay, perfect. so that's gonna be our zero point taking into account the thickness of the retainer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all 16 of these and run them down to bind. 170. And just sort of keep track of what my highest one is. It's 160. And for people who don't know, bind is when the coils can't go any farther. Yep. That's when if you exceed past that point, you're going to break a lot of valve train oh, parts yes. and have hurt feelings. 50, right now still my highest one is 170. So they're all going pretty much past what they said. Yeah, which is expected. Oh yeah. It's pretty expected. Like, like I said, like I- 50 past what they're- Yeah, yeah and that, that's, that's about normal. That's good. I've had some stuff that goes 100 past. Wow. Uh, once again, to go back to PAC, because they seem to make one of the better springs out there. Yeah, they do. Because um, they're one of the few companies that actually, they're their own spring company. They don't like design stuff and then sub it out to get manufactured. Yeah, it, I really looked for a PAC spring for what would work for what I was trying to do. I just couldn't find right. it. Right, but their stuff, when they say something binds at like, you know, 150, for example, and if I check it on here, it's probably going to bind it around like 140 or 130. 140. Wow. They're pretty close. See, that one's 130. But for some stuff, I like to check them. Well, for most stuff, I like to check them, especially if we're setting up something where I like to uh, to go a little bit closer to the edge. And that keeps it from floating. A yep. bit, right? yeah. That helps it get into, uh, keep it from getting into some weird stuff where it wants to dance around because it has a lot of space in between yeah. the coils. Yeah. yeah, there's some pretty interesting videos on YouTube of high-speed valve trains and what a valve spring looks like in some of these engines when it's running, and it's surprised this stuff doesn't break. Oh yeah, they're just basically doing circles in there. Yep. Yeah, and you'll see even when the uh, when the valve's not being opened by the rocker arm, you can see the coils will still yeah do that little wave, dance little up dance. and down yeah, the whole yeah, time. Yeah, that, that's horrible. <laughs> but that's the uh, that's the whole theory behind installing them close to bind is because it gives them less room to surge back and forth and create all sorts of weird issues there. So after I go through all 16 of them and determine the one that was closest, you know, that has the highest bind, sometimes what I'll do is I'll kind of rotate it a little bit because that number will change sort of based off of where the coils are at. And I just kind of do that to make sure I'm giving myself a safety factor. After checking all 16 springs, we found the one that had the highest bind height was 1071. And for the sake of leaving myself some wiggle room, I always round up at least 15 or 20 thousandths. Gotcha. So we're gonna say that our bind that we can't exceed is 1.090. Okay. So we'll call that close enough to the 1100 that Comp advertises the springs at. So our lobe on the cam is 370. Our rocker ratio is 1.6. And we're going to minus about 20 thousandths of lash. So we end up with 0.572. It's going to be our total max lift that this engine should ever see. 
Right where you want it to be. Right where I wanted it to be. Yeah. So, using the handy dandy calculator again, we're going to say our bind was 1.09. We're going to add our max lift of 572, and that puts us at 1.662. So then, let's say we want an extra 60 thousandths on yeah. top of that. So 0 0.060. So our target we're going to shoot for is 1.722. Oh wow, that was more than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I was going to say 1.75, but yeah, that worked. So, that's the install height guy. That's, that's, that's a target. So, we're going to run this guy down to, I think we said 1.730, or thereabouts, and we'll lock that up top. close enough for checking them. And now we're going to go through all 16 of them and see where they're at. Four. And I'm going to sort them from high to low. So this part takes a little bit of memory. It's not bad with 16 springs, but if you're doing like 32 springs, it becomes a pain in the yeah, ass. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that. <laughs> but just to show where we were at. That's the low one, right? This is the low one right now. Which, it's at 184. Yeah. Okay. And then our high one. It's at 196. Uh, I think it should be down to 194 now. Okay. Yep, yeah. So, so and these, pounds, these, wow. these two yeah. were 193. So our high was 194. Our low is 184. When we started out, we were at 196 for our high and our low was 182. So by swapping around inners and outers, we were able to close up a 14 pound difference down to a 10 pound difference. That's, that's huge. So yeah. Sometimes you get lucky, you can close up a 14 pound difference down to like a seven or eight pound difference. But mm -hmm. we're kind of at the mercy of how everything's made and what it works out to yeah, be. Yeah. But still, we've, we've narrowed down our tolerance a little bit from high to low. and. I feel that these are well matched for what we're going to get with them. For the so, most part, I like to see the heavy springs on the intake valves and the lighter springs on the exhaust valves. And the reason for that is ideally, or naturally for most engines, your intake valve's bigger, it's going to be a heavier valve. That's right. So there's yep. more weight you have to control. I gotcha, gotcha. Uh, 1.73, and we're going to subtract, just for using round figures, we'll subtract 570 because that's our valve lift. So our open height should be checking at 1.16. Okay. So we're gonna take the clamp back off. I'm gonna take the high spring and I'm gonna check it at 1.16. 477. I see why that arm's so long now. <laughs> these, these are light compared to some stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get a triple spring in here that has like 350 pounds of seat pressure and over a thousand open. That, yeah, that you, have to, you have to like, yeah, it's a good a a workout for your, uh, your legs. Imagine. Yeah, doing squats with valve spring resistance. And this one's going to 1.16 also. Yeah. So they're even closer on the open height. So we're done with the tester. That's pretty much all we can do with that. Um, a straight wound valve spring, there's, there's formulas out there. I think the proper term is actually called like Hooke's Law or something. It, if it has a constant rate and you should be able to take that constant rate and pick any point out and theoretically say it should be this pressure at this based on the rate. Okay. Um, beehives aren't that way. Conical stuff's not that way. Some of the stuff that's uh, a progressive coil to where they get tighter at the bottom than they are at the top. Yeah, I've seen those. They yeah. don't follow a linear curve, but straight wound stuff, regardless if it's a single dual or triple, they, for the most part, they're supposed to follow a linear curve. Uh, if they don't, it's, you know, 
they're never going to be perfectly linear, but for the most part, they're pretty damn close. All right, guys, we're back at the house. I wanted to go over the stuff that Dennis did for these springs. And like you said before on the video, this is going to be the target stall height. We're going to shoot for one at 725 thousandths. And all the springs you have from the high to low. And when you put them in the box, you put them from high to low. So that way I knew which ones were the high, which ones were the low. That way we could spread them out accordingly to the install heights on the actual head. So let's go over that real quick. And luckily we we're able to get these using the shims and the negative locks on the retainers right in the money area where he wanted them to be. Thank goodness. And you can see right here, uh, most of the intakes are the high ones which have worked out pretty good. So I put the heavier springs on the intake and the highest ones was one inch 727 thousandths. So I put the highest ones there and then I put the lowest ones down accordingly. And the lowest ones at the low were um, one inch 725 thousandths. So these guys are set up pretty good right where Dennis wanted them. Another thing is too, when you're putting these guys together and a lot of people will just use oil, they'll put them on the seals, down the guide, then they'll put the actual valve in there and assemble them. I don't like to use oil if they're gonna sit for a long time. I like to use a good high quality assembly lube. The reason why, because that assembly lube, it won't go nowhere. Oil eventually, when it gets, it gets hot and cold, hot and cold, you know, if it sits for a couple of months, it's all gonna drain past this, end up in the bottom of your valve, and not where you want it, on the valve stem seals. You really want those valve stem seals on startup to be good and lubricated else you burn them up and then you'll have oil leaking past them and your car will smoke every now and then. So I think this setup right here has worked pretty good and if you guys enjoyed this video subscribe, give it a thumbs up and then peace out guys. See you next time.